than anything you've done already. And what do they all have in common, including Jack Ells? They were leading the professionals. British Australia, as a person I've put it many times in my lectures over the years, it's always the amateurs who lead. It's they who lead largely because until very modern times there was no public funding for astronomy. And John Ross had been funded and shouldn't have been anywhere, but that's another story. And if you wanted to do real research, discover new things, find things in the cosmos, the sky, the planets, the deep space, the nebulae, you name it, the faith for yourself. And you built the equipment, designed the equipment, constructed it, and used it in your own time, and you have no committees to report to, no boards, nothing like that. Get on with it. Herschel, Ross, Lasso, you name it. And I see Jack Ells in that tradition as an ingenious amateur in the noblest sense. And as I always remind people, sadly nowadays, the word amateur is rather defamed. It now has the sense of something you tend to do as a hobby. It is not the real meaning. As my darling wife Rachel will tell you, the word amateur derives from the Latin root amat, to love. And the word amateur actually means in Latin, he who loves. Not only on the spare time, he who loves. And so an amateur astronomer is someone, or a woman of course, who loves astronomy. As you probably know, I have coined the term grand amateur. Not only for those who do astronomy out of a love and out of a passion, but also to who are at the cutting edge of the technology and the discoveries. The grand operators at the very forefront of research. At a time, of course, when public observatories, public spending on astronomy was parsimonious and small. At the time when the RAS only contained about three people who were paid for doing astronomy, and the Royal Society, not even that number. The people who were doing the real work were those who dug into their own pockets. Doctors, lawyers, civil servants, barristers, businessmen, and those who married rich ladies. <laughs> and also, too, those who did combinations of things, such as the one great money spent in the Victorian age you could not have all become poor was own a brewery. <laughs> if you, the amount of English astronomical research floated on there, <laughs> I cannot describe the inebriacy of the working classes funded a lot of British astronomy. <laughs> and those who combine that with other things. Such as, well, the one distinguished man, in fact, in the 19th century, Sir James South. He was a surgeon at Guy's and St. Thomas's. He married a wealthy Lambeth brewer's daughter and sole heiress, quit medicine, and devoted the rest of his time to front rank professional astronomy, largely on his wife's fortune. And so this is where it comes. So when you think of amateur astronomy, it's that noble tradition. And I don't mean using your wife's money to fund it. In fact, Lady South is more than glad to provide the money for this to take place. But in fact, the initiative came. Also to John Wall, I knew mean very, very well, and a highly colourful gentleman for those who knew him. A man who took drive mirrors, but probably is needing the size of his tables. A man who was not directly an observer, but fascinated him like some of the people I worked on in the past. His passion was the machinery of astronomy, the optics, the mechanics, the tracking system, the leasing. And because at the time of computing was not as sophisticated as it now is, how to combine all these things together. And that extraordinary genius tradition of how to use fairly basic equipment to make extraordinary pieces of technological devices, such as polishing and figuring machines for very large slabs of glass. And as I told John Wall, 
it was amateurs who pioneered the silver on glass mirror. Quite simply, when the first silver on glass mirrors were tried in France in the 1850s, and yes, they if you put a thin coating of glass of a thin coating of silver on a mirror, it was English amateurs who started to build them in large numbers and very big ones and actually do serious research with it. It was the amateurs who created the modern reflecting telescope. It was they too who created the spectroscope. The spectroscope may have been invented by a series of chemists in a Heidelberg laboratory for chemistry in the laboratory, but it was English amateurs who applied them to the heavens and discovered what the sun was made of, what the stars were made of, and so on. Likewise, too, photography. It was the amateurs who experimented with early emulsions, early plates, commissioned the early lenses, where in fact the refractive index of the lens was right for the sensitivity of the plate. All that. Professional astronomy has always ridden on the back of amateurs. The amateurs have always been the initiators, the risk takers, and the pushing of the boundaries. I suspect we may be returning to this situation in future times. Now, all of these things give a sense of the society, and to be honest, a very, very noble tradition in which you move. And the very fact that in this society, the various varieties of professional backgrounds from which people come reflect where astronomy comes from. Lawyers, medics, anybody on a brewery? Not like the brewers, I know lawyers and medics. And again, that tradition where the engineers come from. But finally, let me tell you two incidents that have happened to me very recently. One of them only last night to give you an idea about how people still are often mystified by the heavens who are not astronomically connected. Now, first of all, about five, six weeks ago, I was going up to Manchester on the train. It was dark, seven o'clock at night, something like that. And the ticket collector was giving on the tickets, giving my ticket. And he's got the ticket, and one day he said to me, Is that a supernova you see in the sky at the moment? <laughs> and I sat there and bending me over and said, Pardon? Pardon? Is that a supernova? He said, I've seen you on telly! <laughs> science and religion. Question something. I start holding a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> right, on the way to Manchester. <laughs> and there's one chap a few yards away from me, head down, clearly registered people like that. And I said and looked at him, excuse me sir, and said, we're not disturbing you, Martin. No, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one incident. Then it all comes from somebody not knowing but a bright object is in the sky. The second one is last night. A gentleman I have known for a good number of years. He's in his early 50s, early retired from the National Health Service, where he was a senior psychiatric nurse, took a BSc 
but not nearly as young yet than all the rest of it. Very, very highly educated child. And he'd asked me a few nights earlier, what's that bright object in the sky? Is it Jupiter? Really? <laughs> BSC! And I said, have you got some binoculars first? Yeah, about 10 by 8 is. Go and have a look at it. Last night, he came to me with a little card in his hand and put it down in front of me on the seat. And he said, you know that thing you were telling me about? And he took it and turned it over. And he drew a circle and another circle there to it said, could that be Jupiter? That's it. That's Jupiter and that's one of its moons. And the other three moons must either be behind it or in front of it. So the only one was visible. And again, an enormous smile came to his face. He said, have I really seen Jupiter? Yeah. He said, that's made my day. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's so easy to see. After all, you've got an ordinary pair of binoculars you might use for bird watching or sport or something. That is twice as good as Galileo's telescope. And of course you can see Jupiter's moons with it. They jump at you. Right, with magnification 10 by 60 or something like that. And that is what I find endlessly. And the number of people who ask me questions and approach me about all sorts of things about astronomy whom I don't know. And I'll tell you, if you know, a green monk appears on TV, as <laughs> I occasionally does, it staggers me the amount of interest that people generate there. In fact, also too, as many of you probably know, I have an operation on my mouth, um, August 2010, and I'm as I was saying to my to my first advice to the doctor, I have many new medical friends in addition to my old medical friends, and I have to do some months to get the job out there possibly with perfectly routine inquiry. And I'm there at the reception desk and the lady's taking my details. And one surgeon friend I know, Steve Bond, was some rooting around me in the reception area behind her, and he waved and came up to me, shook my hands, and said, So you're on TV last night, <laughs> talking about astronomy. He has got interested in astronomy as well. And it is amazing the interest starts to spread. And it's through societies like this that it begins to move. And let me also tell you of another person of mine who is a medical amateur astronomer in Oxford, Dr. Gwyneth Heiter. Now, I don't know, does anybody know Dr. Gwyneth Heiter? No, she was a trainer in Manchester, and now she practices in Oxford. And she's an EMT specialist, ear, nose, and throat specialist. And she's a member of one of the stalwarts of the Abingdon Astronomical Society, just a few miles from Oxford. And what she has done as well, it is fascinating through the history of astronomy to Babylonian astronomy. Needless to say, she learns the Babylonian languages. <laughs> and then starts to work on Babylonian cuneiform texts in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. All in her spare time, if you've got this in people's ears and things like that. And then, for fun, did an Oxford doctor in the subject. <laughs> and so you now have medic astronomer, Babylonian specialist. And it is amazing how these things roll over. Now, this is what amateur societies do. And when you have societies like this, which have an enormous amount of intellectual energy, and an enormous amount of concern with outreach, equipment, and so on, you and other societies do an absolutely first-class job. There's no doubt about that. Now, I know it's particularly unfortunate that place of manner is going to close in the very near future. But I have every, every expectation, sanguine expectation, that the society will continue. And I, as I understand tonight, I will be the last lecturer at the manor, two weeks on Thursday, and I shall be the first lecturer at the new venue in January. So I am also honoured about that. But there has been 37 
in, in January, 37 years of association, delightful and proud association with the Crayford Astronomical Society. It's only beaten by one other society, Salford, my native society in Lancashire, which I joined as a lad and which I now have the honour to serve as president, but that's the only one knowing that I'm a lad born and bred in the area and I've started the family. But Crayford is the one that came to immediately after that. So therefore, may I very honourably, on behalf of the guests, and thank you for this wonderful meal and this wonderful evening and the hotel and everything, on behalf of the Stella Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. May I also 